Stuka Joe here. Today we will be taking a look at this game, Blitz in the East. And we will also be taking a look at its expansion, Scorched Earth. This is a game designed by Antonio and Emanuele Santandrea and published by Vento Nuovo Games. Blitz in the East is a two-player strategic level medium complexity hex and counter war game that recreates World War II in the Eastern Front from 1941 to 1945. Each turn in the game represents two months and units are mostly armies and corps on the Axis side and fronts and armies on the Soviet side. The game uses cards to recreate certain strategic and tactical events. Most cards have lasting effects on the game until they are cancelled by another card or other circumstances. Scorched Earth is the expansion for Blitz in the East and it adds rules, counters and cards to the base game. Today we will be going through the base game's sequence of play as well as the strategic and tactical event cards and their effects. We will also take a look at the Scorched Earth expansion with its rules, counters, and cards. In this game, each year comprises six two-month periods, and each period has an Axis turn followed by a Soviet turn. The player that is executing his turn is the phasing player, and the other player is the non-phasing player. The first phase in the sequence of play is the administrative phase, and you can see the segments that comprise the phase there. Some of them involve the drawing and playing of strategic cards. Let's take a look at the cards in this game. This game includes 28 cards, 11 axes and 17 Soviet cards. Some of these cards are strategic cards. These are the ones that are shown in a vertical or portrait orientation. And others are tactical cards, which are shown in a landscape orientation. And there's no limit of number of cards that a player can hold. But the player can only play one strategic and one tactical card per turn. Cards show the turn in which they come into play. And they also have symbology indicating what the effect of the card is. The rulebook has an event card summary with all the effects of the cards listed in detail. During the strategic card play subface, the phasing player can play any one of the strategic cards he has in hand, but once played, a strategic card remains in play for the rest of the game unless it is canceled by another strategic card or an event. Next is the initial supply check, but note that there's going to be a final supply check at the end of the turn with devastating circumstances for unsupplied units. But in this initial supply check, the phasing player checks the supply status of his units, production centers, and rail yards. And a unit, production center, or rail yard is in supply if it can trace a line of friendly control hexes to its supply source, either directly or through a supply link. And in this game, Axis supply sources are any Axis minor capital, and you see the list here, as well as Berlin and Vienna. And the only Soviet supply source is Siberia, which is off the map, via supply links with Kirov and Saratov. And units that are out of supply suffer many penalties in this game. Air and ground units may be supplied by sea, and there's two types of ports. Major ports, which have an anchor symbol with a blue background, and minor ports, which have the anchor symbol with a white background. Side has control of a sea when it controls at least two of the three major ports in the sea. And we see the Black Sea and the major ports are Constanta, Sevastopol, and Batumi. And at the beginning of the game, the Russians control Sevastopol and Batumi, so they start with control of the Black Sea. 
three major ports in the Baltic Sea are Danzig, Helsinki, and Leningrad. The Axis controls Danzig and Helsinki, so the Axis starts with control of the Baltic Sea. This game production centers and rail yards trace supply only via land hexes, so they, if they are unable to do so, we place an out of supply marker on the hex. Next is production point collection. In this game production centers represent the production of resources that are needed for major attack operations, as well as to reorganize, replenish, upgrade and resurrect units and also paid for what is called upfront penalty costs. And there's three types of production centers in the game, factories, mining centers and oil fields. Factories and mining centers produce goods, while oil fields produce, well, oil. In this phase, the phasing player updates the production track and collects one production point for each friendly control production center that can trace land supply. Before continuing, let's take a look at the hit progression in this game because units become cadres and become disorganized and resources are spent to bring them to full strength and organized. Here we have an organized full strength unit. If it takes a hit, we place a disorganized marker on the unit. Many functions in the game require the unit to be organized. If the unit takes a second hit, we remove the disorganized marker and flip the unit to its cadre side. Now it's an organized cadre. And if it takes a third hit, now we place a disorganized marker on the cadre. If it takes a fourth hit, the unit is destroyed. In this segment, the phasing player enters reinforcements onto the map and spends production points. Production points can be spent or accumulated, and for this we use markers to update the total production points remaining on the production point track. The phasing player can spend production points to purchase an attack chit, and this costs two goods and two oil. Purchase of an attack chit allows the phasing player not only to conduct the attack and blitz phases, but also to reorganize two non-upfront ground units or one upfront ground unit at no additional cost. A player can spend production points to reorganize a unit, and this allows ground units to change from disorganized to organized. Or a player can spend production points to replenish air and ground units from cadre to full strength. Note that as to the Soviets, they are unable to replenish their units until later in the game. With the play of the Konyev card, they can replenish infantry units. When they play the Shukov card, they can replenish armor units. And by play of the Yak-3 card, air units. Player can also spend production points to upgrade certain units. There are four Soviet cavalry units that are upgraded to tank units by playing the Rokosovsky card. And on the Axis side, the Axis player can upgrade a cadre Italian infantry unit to a full-strength Alpine infantry unit, and he can upgrade a cadre Hungarian cavalry unit to a full-strength infantry unit also. Player can also spend production points to resurrect units, that is, return them from the destroyed pool as cadres. Note that Soviets are unable to resurrect their air units until they play the Sturmovic card. The Axis player is the phasing player. He has 10 goods and 6 oil accumulated. He starts by purchasing the offensive chit at a cost of 2 goods and 2 oil to conduct operations during the upcoming attack and blitz phases. And this also allows him 
to freely reorganize a disorganized cadre Finnish Alpine infantry and a disorganized cadre Hungarian cavalry because both are not up front. He then decides to upgrade the organized cadre Hungarian cavalry at a cost of two goods. He replenishes the organized cadre German 11th infantry also at a cost of two goods. Next, he replenishes the organized cadre German 1st Panzer by paying one goods plus one oil and one additional oil for the unit being up front. And the organized cadre Romanian Alpine Infantry by paying two goods and an additional goods for also being up front. After spending 10 goods and four oil, the Axis player adjusts his goods and oil markers on the production track to two oil and zero goods. In the strategic rail movement phase, the phasing player can move one of his organized and supplied ground units between friendly controlled and in supply rail yards. Next is air and ground operational movement. The phasing player can move any number of his air units up to double their full movement allowance. And if they're out of supply, it's up to normal movement allowance. But movement has to end in a friendly controlled and supply air base. In ground operational movement, the player ignores normal terrain and weather effects. Each hex that is traversed costs one movement point, and the phasing player can move any number of his organized and supplied ground units up to their full movement allowance. Ground units that use operational movement cannot move again during the ground movement phase, but they could potentially move again during the blitz phase, and in the game they recommend that the phasing player rotate any moved ground unit by 90 degrees as a reminder. In the ground movement phase, the phasing player may move any organized and supplied ground units that have not performed operational movement up to their full movement allowance, paying the full cost for departing zones of control, terrain, and weather effects. Disorganized ground units and all air units may not move during this phase. In this example, the Axis player is the phasing player, and he wants to take advantage of the clear weather, so he advances three units across the Romanian frontier into the Soviet Union. The Soviet 12th Infantry and 2nd Cavalry project a zone of control into the hexes that you see here. Although up front, the Romanian 3rd Alpine Infantry does not start its movement in the Soviet 12th Infantry's zone of control, and only spends one movement point to cross the Prut River into Kishinev. Continuing movement to the right of the Soviet 12th Infantry requires three movement points, one for the clear terrain, plus two movement points for simultaneously exiting and entering an enemy zone of control. At this point, the Romanian 3rd Alpine Infantry has expended its maximum four movement point limit and has to stop. The German 11th Infantry moves rightward across the Prut River for one movement point and then across the Niester River for another movement point. Now being inside the Soviet 2nd Cavalry's zone of control and only having a maximum of four movement points, it could only continue moving another hex into Vinitsa for two movement points or across the Bug River for two movement points. The Romanian 4th Infantry moves across the Danube River for one movement point and then across the Dniester River for another movement point. Now being inside the Soviet 2nd Cavalry zone of control and only having a maximum of three movement points, it has to stop. 
in the attrition phase, players verify if any of them have air or armor superiority, and then they compare the strength of their upfront ground units. And finally, cross index the result on the attrition table to determine the number of hits caused on the opponent, claimed attrition hexes, and battles and air reactions. The attrition phase in this game is mandatory, but the battle and air reaction markers represent the maximum number of battles and air reactions that the phasing player and non-phasing player can play during each of the attack and blitz phases, but these are only applicable if the phasing player purchased the offensive chit. Now we conduct superiority checks. We have to determine which side has air superiority and which side has armor superiority. And these will provide favorable column shifts. This example, the Romanian air unit and three of the five available Soviet air units were destroyed during turn one. For the Axis player's attrition phase on turn two, the Axis player has three valid air units. The Soviets have two valid air units to determine air superiority. Note that while the Axis has four supplied air units in play, the Finnish air unit is not within range. That is three hexes of a friendly upfront ground unit and is therefore invalid. Of their valid air units, the Axis has one cadre and two full-strength units, and the Soviets have two cadre units. So the Axis has a 5-2 to two advantage, resulting in air superiority, because it's 2-1 to one or more. So they have air superiority for the phase, and we place the air superiority marker on the board. In this example, the Axis player has four armor units in play, but only three of them are valid for armor superiority. That is, they are organized, supplied, and upfront, or organized, supplied, and adjacent to a friendly upfront ground unit, and all three valid armor units are at full strength. The Soviet player has three valid armor units for armor superiority, and all Soviet armored units are at cadre level. So the Axis has a 6 to 3 advantage, and that gives them armor superiority for the phase. So we place the armor superiority marker on the board on the Axis side. Next is attrition resolution. Let's take a look at an attrition example. It's the Axis turn, and the Axis has a total strength of 70. 16 valid upfront ground units. The Soviets have a total strength of 30 from 9 upfront ground units. Note that the 23rd Infantry has its strength tripled because Leningrad is a fortress. The two total strength numbers are crossed indexed on the attrition table to give an initial 2 to 1 result, and they are shifted two columns to the right because of Axis air and armor superiority so it is a final four to one result the soviets suffer four hits and the axis suffers one hit and earns four claimed attrition hex markers the axis purchased an offensive chit so it also receives four battle markers and the soviets receive one air reaction mark and these will be used in each of the upcoming attack and blitz phases the Soviet player applies his four hits first. The Cadre 7th Infantry shifts to Disorganize, as well as the Cadre 23rd Infantry and the Cadre 20th Infantry. And the Disorganized Cadre 5th Infantry shifts to Destroy. Now the Axis player applies his sole hit to the Cadre Finnish Alpine Infantry, which shifts to disorganized the axis then immediately conducts a free advance of the german rs infantry into the hex vacated by the soviet fifth infantry 
The Axis player now claims and advances into the following three hexes one at a time. Advances into the hex occupied by the Soviet 21st Infantry. And that unit has to retreat to any of the two top adjacent hexes to avoid taking a hit and becoming disorganized. The German 9th Infantry and 18th Infantry advance into the hex. The Germans also claim the hex occupied by the Soviet 19th Infantry, and that unit must retreat downward, taking a hit because it is up front and becoming disorganized. Meanwhile, the German 2nd Panzer and 16th Infantry will advance into the hex. And finally, the Germans claim the hex occupied by the Soviet 6th Infantry, which is unable to retreat and it is destroyed and the Italian CSIR infantry will advance into the hex. Now the Axis still has one of his four claimed attrition hex markers, and of course wants to claim and advance into some other hexes, but because of the lack of an advancing ground unit or prohibited terrain, this is impossible. Next is the attack phase, and this phase only occurs if the phasing player purchased the offensive chit during the administrative phase. With each available battle marker, the phasing player, who is now the attacker, may battle a hex occupied by the non-phasing player. There's air battles and ground battles. Let's take a look at an example of an air battle. In this example, the Axis player is the attacker during the attack phase, and weather is clear. The Axis player plays one of his four battle markers onto Krivoy Rog, and moves the full-strength German S air five hexes from Lwov into the hex for an air battle against the cadre Soviet W air unit. The Soviet player cannot play an air reaction marker in this situation. Simultaneously, the Axis player rolls two dice. The rolls are a four and a five. The Soviet player rolls one die, and the result is a four. And this results in two hits scored for the Axis and none for the Soviets. The Soviet W air is destroyed and immediately moves to the destroyed unit box for future resurrection. The German F air remains in Krivoy Rog, until air unit rebasing occurs after resolving the phase's last battle. In this ground combat example, the Axis player plays a battle marker onto Kiev to launch a ground battle with the 1st Panzer, the 6th Infantry, and the C air unit from Vilnius, which flew from five hexes away. Although the Soviet player has one air reaction marker to spend, he does not have any air units in range due to the Axis player's previous successful air battles. Both players calculate and compare their total ground strength. It is 14 for the Axis and 6 for the Soviets. The cadre Soviet 4th tank is organized Therefore, it has double strength defending in urban terrain. The ground combat ratio is 2 to 1, and it is modified to 4 to 1 because of the Axis player's close air support bonus. The full strength C air unit causes a two column shift to the right. The Axis player rolls a 2, and this results in two hits for each player. The Soviet 4th tank unit, an organized cadre, is destroyed and it is moved to the destroyed box and it can be brought to the game later. The Axis player has three options to consider now. He can apply one hit to each ground unit or apply both hits to either ground unit. The Axis wants to capture Kiev. Notice that exerting a friendly zone of control onto the empty enemy control urban hex is not sufficient to change control. And the Axis also want to safeguard the German 1st Panzer's later blitzing capability. It has to be organized 
and at full strength. So the Axis player decides to apply both hits to the German 6th Infantry, now an organized cadre, and then advance the German 1st Panzer and 6th Infantry into Kiev. The German Sea Air remains in Kiev until air unit rebasing after resolving the phase's last battle. Note that the Axis player was not able to launch the desired ground battle into Odessa due to the initial ground combat ratio being less than 1 to 1. The total ground strength for the Axis was 5. This is because the full strength German 11th Infantry's strength is halved when it attacks across an unfrozen river. And the strength of the Soviets was 6. The cadre Soviet Odessa Infantry is organized and has double strength defending in urban terrain. The blitz phase occurs if the phasing player meets the following conditions. He has purchased the offensive chit, at least one blitz capable organized supplied and full strength armor unit is available, and he has played the appropriate strategic card. So which units can participate in the blitz phase? Blitzing armor units, supplied air units that are adjacent to blitzing armored units, and organized and supplied ground units that are adjacent to a blitzing armor unit. Starting in 1942, the range for participating units to a blitzing armor unit increases from being adjacent to being within two friendly control hexes. Continuing with the previous example, the Axis player has resolved all his battles. He rebased the German sea air unit from Kiev, five hexes back to Vilnius. He rebased the German S air unit from Krivoy Rog, two hexes to Kiev. During the blitz phase, the Axis player determines that only the first Panzer meets all of the requirements for designation as a blitzing armor unit. That is, it is blitz capable, organized, supplied, and at full strength. The Kleist strategy card was played at the beginning of the game. And since it is 1941, only the organized and supplied 6th Infantry and supplied S air unit located in Kiev may join the 1st Panzer and participate in the Blitz phase. The Axis player now ponders his options with the three units that he has for this phase. He can move and then attack again, playing the four battle markers that he gained in the attrition phase. Other Axis units, however, cannot move or attack. The Soviets can react with the one air reaction marker gained during the attrition phase. Note that it is impossible to battle the 2-5 organized cavalry in Perekop. It is in a swamp. It is an organized defender, which is doubled to four. So the axes do not meet the initial ground combat ratio requirement of equal or higher than one to one because armor cannot attack in a swamp. And the four three infantry would be half to two for river crossing. However, the Axis player notices that Soviet air units are out of reach from Odessa. So the Axis could use these three units to battle Odessa. The 6th Infantry could move into the hex occupied by the Romanian infantry, while the armored unit could move to a hex across the bug from which it could attack, although at half strength. The total attack would be 8 to 6, but there would be a pincer bonus and an air support bonus that increases the odds to 4 to 1 with an 83% chance to seize the city. During the final phase, there's a final supply check where the phasing player checks the status of all his out of supply units, his production centers and rail yards. And he removes the out of supply marker from any of these 
that can now trace supply to a supply source. Now, production centers and rail yards that remain out of supply keep the out of supply markers. Units that remain out of supply immediately suffer two hits and they maintain the out of supply markers unless they are destroyed. And if they are destroyed, they surrender. Axis units that surrender are moved to the Siberia box and they are permanently removed from the game. Soviet units that surrender are temporarily moved to the Hiwis box where they provide a Hiwis bonus to the Axis. Then they are moved to the destroyed box from which they can be brought back to play. And during this phase, we conduct a victory check we use the scenario instructions to see if there is a blitz or decisive victory. Certain cities on the map have an oak leaves symbol with a number from 1 to 4. For each number, there are three cities. For example, here you see Riga, you see also Minsk, and Lwów. If all three cities are captured by the Axis in turn 1, then the Axis player rolls a die if he rolls a 1, he obtains a blitz victory and the game ends immediately. And then there's also cities associated with turn 2. And those are Smolensk, Kiev, and Odessa. In this case, if the Axis by turn 2 captures all three cities, Axis player rolls a die. With a 1 and a 2, he wins the game. There's three more cities for turn three, Leningrad, Tula, and Kharkov. If the Axis player captures all three by turn three, he rolls a die, and a one through three, he wins the game. And finally, the turn four cities are Moscow, Rostov, and Sevastopol. If he captures all three, he rolls a die in turn four, and if it's a 1 to a 4, then the Axis player wins a Blitz victory. If the Axis player has not met any victory conditions, then we flip the turn marker to the Soviet side and begin the Soviet turn. Let's take a look at the cards that are included in Blitz in the East. And we will start with the Axis cards. Axis begins the game with two cards already played with its effects already in place from turn one. This is the Guderian and Kleist cards. The Guderian card allows the Axis to blitz with the second Panzer Army, and it is cancelled if Moscow has not been captured when the Soviets play the OKH intervenes card. Meanwhile, the Kleist card allows the Germans to blitz with their first Panzer army, and it is cancelled if Rostov has not been captured when the Soviets play the OKH intervenes card. These cards begin the game as played, denoted by the check mark on the top right hand corner, and that is the characteristic of most of the cards here. Their effects remain throughout the game as long as the card is played and has not been cancelled. The next card is Iran joins the Axis, a turn two card. The effect is that Iranian hexes immediately become playable and the Soviets starting during the next production point collection subphase immediately lose one oil per turn as long as the card is in play. Now this card can be cancelled if the Soviets control Tabriz. If they do so, in addition, the 53rd Infantry Unit shown, which is a cadre, arrives as a reinforcement during the next turn. The Paulus card is available on turn 3, and the effect is that the Soviets cannot play the OKH Intervenes card, but the Axis cannot purchase the offensive chit during turns 3 to 6. Now this card can be cancelled if it is not played on turn 3, so the Axis player has to decide 
in turn three when he receives the card, if he will play it or not, otherwise the effects of this card will never occur. The next card is a tactical card available in turn seven. This is 1942 denoted by the yellow background in the circle on the top right hand corner. And it requires that the Axis have air superiority in order to play this card. And if they play this card, the Axis has a two column shift on the ground combat results table during one battle against an urban hex, but only during the attack phase. The next card is Fall Blau, available in turn eight. There's a requirement that the Axis have to control Kharkov and Sevastopol in order to play this card. The effect is that the Axis receive a free offensive chip and the RHB infantry unit arrives in Kharkov as an organized cadre. This card is canceled the turn when the card is played or at the end of turn nine if the card is not played at all. So upon receiving this card, the Axis has to play it in turn eight or nine or never at all. Next is the Pioneer's card, a tactical card available on turn nine. The effect of the card is that the Axis receive one column shift to the right on the ground combat results table during a battle in an urban hex, during an attack or blitz phase. Next is the Manstein card, which is available in turn 11, 1943. The effects are that the Axis receive the SS Panzer and 8th Infantry units, both as organized cadres, and the Axis player can select any full strength organized and supplied Panzer unit to blitz during each turn. Next card is a tactical card, Heavy Panzer Battalion, and it is available on turn 13. There's a requirement that it has to be used during clear weather. And the effect is that the Axis receives a one column shift to the right on the ground combat result table in one battle against an open terrain hex, either during the attack or blitz phase. The next card is Citadel. This card is available in turn 14. It has a requirement for use that the Axis have to control both Kharkov and Sevastopol. And the effect of this card is that the Axis get a free offensive chip. Now this card can be canceled during the turn it is played. And if it is not played, it is canceled at the end of turn 15. So this is another card that has to be used during its turn of entry 14 or the next turn or never at all. And the last card in the Blitz in the East base game for the Axis is Festung. This card is available in turn 22, which is 1944. And its effects are that Berlin and Breslau immediately become fortresses. Now let's take a look at the Soviet cards in Blitz in the East. The Great Patriotic War. This is a card that the Soviet player begins with in his hand and he has to decide in turn one whether he will play the card or discard the card. If the Soviet player plays the card he won't receive any production points nor spend any during turn one. And for the rest of the game while this card is in effect he spends one less goods for each ground unit that he resurrects. He can reorganize all non upfront disorganized and in supply ground units without paying any production points. And if the offensive chit is purchased, he can reorganize two upfront disorganized and supply ground units at no production point costs. Also, he can conduct battles on the one to two ratio column. In this game, normally you cannot attack at less than one to one odds. Now, the downside is that he can purchase the offensive chip but at double of the cost for the remainder of the game. Now this card is canceled at the end of turn 10 or before if the Axis capture Moscow, in which case we roll 1d6 
and add the result to the turn number, and that will indicate the turn when the card is canceled, and that is at the end of the turn. And we place the Great Patriotic War marker on the ending turn as a reminder. Sturmovik, this is a turn one card, and its effect is that it allows the Soviets to resurrect air units, that is, to bring them back to play from the eliminated box. Next is Katyusha, a tactical card available in turn two, and its effect is that the Soviets receive a one column shift on the ground combat result table for one battle during the attack or blitz phase. Next is Len Lease, a turn three card, and its effect is that the Soviets receive extra goods during each turn's production point collection subphase. In 1941, it's one extra goods. In 42, two. In 43, three. In 44, four. And in 45, five extra goods. The number of goods received can be reduced by a maximum of one per turn if the axes control any of the three lend lease hexes shown here, or any of these hexes are unable to trace a supply route to Siberia. The next card is Pearl Harbor, turn four card. The effect is that the Soviets receive the Kal infantry unit during the turn the card is played and the Sta infantry unit during the next turn, both units as full strength reinforcements. The next card is OKH Intervenes, available in turn 5, 1942. The effects are that the Guderian card is immediately removed if the Axis have not captured Moscow at this time, and also the Kleist card is removed if the Axis have not captured Rostov. This card is cancelled if the Axis player plays the Paulus card, or if the Axis player captures both Moscow and Rostov. The Red Guard tactical card is available in turn 7, and its effect is that the Soviets get a one column shift to the right on the combat result table in one battle during the attack or blitz phase. Poniev, this is a turn 8 card, and its effect is that the Soviets can now replenish infantry units, that is, they can rebuild them to full strength. Shukov is a turn 9 card, and its effects are that the Soviets receive the first guard tank unit as a full strength reinforcement, and this is a blitz capable unit. In addition, the Soviets can now replenish armor units. Uranus is available in turn 10, and its effect is that the Soviets receive a free attack chit. Now, this card can be canceled during the turn it is played in the production point expenditure and reinforcement entry subphase, or at the end of turn 11 if it is not played. So that's one of the cards that we see in this game that uh, involve offensive capabilities but can only be used during the turn it is received or the next turn. Airborne Assault is a tactical card available in turn 13. This is 1943. And the effect is that the Soviets can ignore river penalties during one battle in the attack or blitz phase. Mussolini Dismissed is available in turn 14, and its effects are that during each Soviet victory check phase, the Soviets roll one die until both of the following actions occur. And a die roll of three or more, unless the unit is in Siberia or out of supply, the SS Panzer unit is removed. And if it is out of supply, it is removed once in supply. And on a die roll of four or more, Italy surrenders, and all the surrendering provisions in the rules for Italy take effect. Rokosovsky, 
becomes available in turn 16, and its effects are that the Soviets receive the second guard tank blitz unit as a full strength reinforcement, and this is also blitz capable. In addition, the Soviets can now upgrade cadre cavalry units to full strength armor units. Vasilevsky is available in turn 17. This is 1944. And its effect is that the Soviets can now stack two ground units in a hex. The normal stacking rules are two for the Germans and one unit for the Soviets until this card is played. Yak 3. This card is available in turn 18. And its effect is that the Soviets can now replenish air units. That is, bring them up to full strength. D-Day. This card is available in turn 19, and there is a requirement. To play this card, the Soviets have to have control of Leningrad, and if so, the effect is that during each Soviet victory check, the Soviets roll one die until they roll a four or more, in which case Finland surrenders. And the last Soviet card in Blitz in the East is Bagration, and this card enters the game in turn 20. Its effect is that the Soviets receive a free offensive chip. Like other offensive cards, this card is cancelled during the turn when it is played in the Production Point Expenditure and Reinforcement Entry subphase, or at the end of turn 21 if it is not played. So this is another card that only has a two turn window to be played. The Scorched Earth expansion for Blitz in the East adds various rules to the base game as well as cards. Let's take a look at the rules included with the expansion. The expansion modifies the strategic rail movement rules by introducing rail capacity. Each control and converted rail yard in the game is worth one point towards a side's rail capacity, and a side may move one ground unit per 10 strategic rail movement points. Rail yards need to be converted to a side's rail gauge in order to count for rail capacity purposes. The expansion introduces an additional phase the final restoration phase, where the phasing player can repair disabled infrastructure and also convert enemy gauged rail yards. Each repair and conversion costs one goods and two goods if in a hex that is up front. Major ports, factories, mining centers, and oil fields are operational only if friendly controlled, not disabled, and in land supply. As the name of the expansion implies, each side may attempt to disable infrastructure that is captured by the enemy by play of a side's Scorched Earth card, and we will see ahead how this card works. The expansion adds a Fall Blau scenario that begins in turn 7, and players may choose to play up to the end of the war, which is turn 28, or up to turn 10. Also included is the Balkans pacified scenario, where it is assumed that the Greeks allowed the Italians to base aircraft in their country, and the Axis conquest of the Balkans and the assault on Crete did not occur. This scenario can last from turn 1 to turn 4 or until the conclusion of the war in turn 28. Let's take a look at the cards in the Scorched Earth expansion. This expansion adds 28 new cards, 12 for the Soviets and 16 for the Axis. The expansion also modifies the rules concerning cards. With the expansion, a player can draw two cards during the card draw subphase instead of one. If he draws two, he has to pay one goods. 
but he always has to choose one card to play per turn. Let's take a look first at the Axis cards. The Axis begin the game with the Leningrad card in the player's hand. And its effect is that it replaces Moscow with Leningrad for Guderian card purposes. What this means is that if this Leningrad card is played, it allows the German 2nd Panzer Army to conduct blitzes. And it would be cancelled if Leningrad, not Moscow, has not been captured when the Soviets play the OKH Intervene card. This card is also cancelled if it hasn't been played at the end of turn 4. So, the Germans have a choice up to turn 4 to decide whether they're going for Moscow or Leningrad. Ukraine's Dawn. This card is available in 1941 as denoted by the orange circle on the top right hand corner. Its effect is that Ukrainian production centers that have not yet been disabled by the Soviet Scorched Earth card receive a minus one die roll modifier for any future Soviet attempts to disable them. Normally, the Soviets need a die roll of four or more to disable production centers, but with this card, it's a bit harder. They need five or more. And the Ukrainian production centers are Kiev, Kharkov, Nepropetrovsk, Krivoy Rog, Stalino, and Voroshilovgrad. And this card is cancelled at the end of turn six. Turkish Chromite. This card is available in 1941, and its effect is that it allows the Axis to receive one additional goods per turn if Odessa is Axis controlled. And it is cancelled once the Soviet British Landings in Greece card is played, or as soon as the Soviets recapture Odessa. Next card is the Axis Intelligence card. It is available in 1942. Its effects are as used by a phasing player for the Axis to steal a Soviet card from the Soviet player's hand, in which case the card is returned to its deck. And as a non-phasing player, the Axis can use this card to negate the Soviet intelligence card. That is when the Soviets want to steal a card from the Axis player's hand. Waffen SS available in 1942, and it allows the Axis to receive one additional goods per turn. Arctic U-Boats is available in 1942, and it allows the Axis, in the event that the Soviets play the Len Lease card, and the Axis roll four or more with a single die to reduce the Soviet Len Lease input by one goods. The Vlasov card enters in 1942. It allows the Axis to receive one additional goods per turn, and it is canceled and removed from the game once the Soviet Tito card is played. Turkey Pro Axis 1942 card. This allows the Axis, if Stalingrad and Grozny are controlled by the Axis, to apply a one column shift to the right on the combat result table for any battle into a Soviet control hex that borders with Turkey during the attack and blitz phases. And this card is cancelled and removed from the game once the Soviet British landings in Greece card is played or if Romania surrenders. Flag Towers. This is a 1943 card. And this card has an effect whenever the Soviets play the Strategic Bombardment card. It allows the Axis an opportunity to reduce by one the number of dice rolled by the Soviets if the Axis roll a four or more with a single die. Synthetic Fuel, a 1943 card. Its effect is that it allows the Axis to receive one additional oil per turn. Gross 
Deutschland. This is a tactical card that enters the game in 1943, and it allows the Axis to apply one column shift to the right on the combat result table during one battle in the attack or blitz phase. Scorched Earth. This is a card that is available in 1944 for the Axis, and it allows them in situations when the Soviets capture a major port, a factory, an oil field, or a mining center to immediately attempt to disable the facility. For that, the Axis player rolls 1d6 and needs a 5 or more. Next is Jet Fighters, a 1944 card. This card allows each German full-strength air unit to receive a hit bonus in air-to-air -air combat. Normally, air units from the Axis hit on four or more with a 1d6, but in this case, it would be three or more. The Volkstrom card is available in 1944, and it allows the Axis to receive one additional goods per turn. There are two additional Axis cards included with the expansion, but these are only applicable to the Balkans pacified scenarios included with the game. Let's take a closer look. The Balkans pacified scenario assumes that Greece accepted Italy's petition for basing air units in October of 1940, preventing the Balkan campaign altogether. So there was no Operation Mercury and the mauling of German paratroops there. So the Balkans pacified card enters play at the beginning of the game. It is considered in effect and its effect is that the first panzer army starts the game at full strength and the Fallschirm Jagger card starts the game in the Axis player's hand and the Tito card is immediately removed from the game. The Axis player starts the game with the Fallschirm Jagger card in his hand and the effect is that the Axis player can ignore any river penalties in one battle during the attack or the blitz phase. Now let's take a look at the Soviet cards included with the Scorched Earth expansion. The Soviet Scorched Earth card is available in the Soviet player's hand at the beginning of the game. And its effect is that whenever the Axis capture a Soviet major port, factory, oil field, or mining center, the Soviet player immediately roll 1d6 and on a four or more the captured facility will be disabled beginning of the game the soviets have in their hand the naval evacuation card this is a tactical defensive card and its effect allows the non-phasing soviet player whenever a port is attacked to evacuate one soviet ground unit from the attack port to another non-attack port in the same sea. But for this, the Soviets have to have control of the sea in question. 1941 evacuation of industry. This card allows the Soviets during the strategic rail movement subphase at a cost of one strategic rail movement point to evacuate one friendly controlled and non-front factory that is in land supply to Siberia. However, this evacuated factory does not start production until the turn after it arrives in Siberia. And this card is canceled and removed at the end of turn four. The next card is Partisans, available 1941. Its effect is in conjunction with the play of the Scorched Earth card. When the Soviets play the Scorched Earth card, and this card is in effect, the Soviets, instead of rolling one die to attempt to disable an infrastructure facility, now roll two dice. Winter Tracks. This card is available in 1941, and its effect is that Soviet cadre armor units only pay one movement point to enter open terrain hexes during snowy or blizzard weather. The Soviet intelligence card enters the game in 1942. The Soviet player can use it during his turn as the phasing player 
to steal a card from the Axis player. And the Soviet can use it also during the Axis turn as a non-phasing player to negate the Axis intelligence card when the Axis wants to steal one card from the Soviets. Strategic Bombardment. This card is a 1942 card. Its effect is that during the Axis production point collection subphase, the Soviet roll a determined number of dice, that is 2 in 1942, 3 in 43, 4 in 44, and 5 dice in 1945, and this can potentially reduce Axis production. On a roll of 1 to 4, there's no effect, but on a roll of 5, the Axis lose 1 goods, and on a roll of 6, they lose 1 oil. The next card is NKVD. It is a 1942 card, and for the Soviets to play this card, Stalingrad has to be Soviet-controlled and in supply. The effect is, during the turn that the card is played only, the Soviets roll one die and convert Stalingrad to a fortress if the die result is four or more. And this is a one-time attempt, so if you fail, there's no other chance during the game. In addition, Soviet voluntary retreats during the attack and blitz phases are prohibited, and Soviet naval evacuations are also prohibited. In addition, Soviet ground units that receive a mandatory retreat result from the 2 to 1 and 3 to 1 columns of the ground combat table ignore the retreat result but suffer one additional hit. Next is Baku, a 1942 card. Its effects is that Baku now becomes a Soviet supply source and the Soviets receive an additional 10 points of strategic rail movement per turn. Torch is a card that is available in 1943 and its effect is that the Axis immediately and permanently remove one full strength air unit from the game. And if no air units are available at full strength, then they must replenish one at the earliest opportunity and then remove it from the game. The next card is Tito, and this is a 1944 card. Its effects are that all Albanian and Yugoslav hexes that are not occupied or within the zone of control of Axis ground units immediately become friendly controlled hexes for the Soviets. And the Axis Vlasov card is immediately removed from the game. And finally, the last Soviet card in the Scorched Earth expansion is British Landings in Greece. And it is available in 1944. The effects are that the Axis Turkish Chromite and Turkey becomes pro-Axis cards are immediately removed from the game. And all Greek hexes that are unoccupied or not within the zone of control of Axis ground units immediately become Soviet-friendly controlled hexes. This is Blitz in the East and the Scorched Earth expansion. I hope that this video has given you a good idea of the flow of the game and what the game has to offer. This is Stuka Joe, signing off now. Thanks for watching.